So the PMRC is the Parents Music Resource Center, which was founded in the mid-1980s by uh, a couple of uh, women who uh, just so happened to be uh, married to uh, important Washington politicians at the time, among them uh, Tipper Gore and a few others, about four or five of them. One of them actually had overheard her daughter, I believe, uh, doing aerobics of some sort and listening to a song by Prince, and it was actually a song by Prince called Darling Nikki that got her interested in the, let's say, in the control of access of information that was communicated through popular music records to uh, young people, because in that song there is a reference to masturbation. And then it kind of led to an inquiry into other songs and to a certain movement that was supposedly happening in uh, pop and rock music, which was then referred to actually as porn rock, pornographic rock. So the reference was made to the fact that, um, that popular music was getting to be quite raunchy in its lyrics, in its treatment of sexual themes. That was the initial focus of the group. Then the group was a private group, but uh, uh, despite the fact that it was a private group, they managed to have a hearing organized before a Senate committee. And obviously the fact that the members of the group were linked to Washington politics probably had a lot to do with that. The hearing itself then was held in September 1985 and they aired uh, various issues that had to do with uh, music and what uh, music, uh, particularly towards young people, what uh, uh, music could uh, uh, imply towards the health and the well-being of young people. Now, um, the issue, of course, is one issue at least, is that it is strange that such a hearing is held when no legislation is pending, because uh, hearings in, uh, before committees, before Senate committees, are typically only held uh, for particular legislation. And in this case, it was more like one of the speakers said, to air the issue, so to talk about the issue. Now, uh, the speakers then were members of the committee, and on the part of the musicians, uh, some musicians indeed were speaking. Uh, John Denver was there, uh, the lead singer of Twisted Sister and Frank Zappa. What was the implic? So it was a big hoopla. There was a lot to do about it in the mid 80s. You can actually watch those, a lot of those shows on YouTube these days. There were interviews all over the place, Larry King, all kinds of talk shows on CNN and, and the other national media. The actual implication of it all was that it led to a sticker. And that was it. It led to the sticker that is now still used on CDs and that you can also see in iTunes which says, you know, explicit uh, warning, parental advisory. And that sticker was um, the only way in which the uh, music industry, the RAAA, so which represents the music industry in the United States of America, was voluntarily, supposedly voluntarily, uh, willing to do something about music and to provide information, particularly towards parents, to know that, you know, there is some material on this record that makes it, you know, objectionable, or at least that makes it uh, useful for parents to maybe take a closer look at what it is that the music is that uh, their youngsters are listening to. The PMRC definitely had an immediate effect. I mean, the, the very the hearings that were held at the, at the, before the Senate was a direct uh, consequence of the activities of the PMRC. Uh, furthermore, like I said, the, all these uh, activities led to a lot of uh, public debate about music and about the influence, uh, the potentially uh, negative influence of popular music on, again, on young people particularly. So there was a lot to do about it. At the same time, it also had a little bit of a negative connotation attached to it, not only that there, was, uh, that there were concerns that all of this might involve censorship, and that it would be, you know, that it would lead to a certain slippery slope and that it would lead to control of information and obviously control of the arts. But it was also a little bit negative in the sense that there was a lot of hoopla about this issue. And that people, it, it, it was kind of a little bit mocked at the same time as that there were some concerns expressed 
So to another extent, it's like, what is this all about, you know, and aren't we going too far? So I would say that at the same time, almost, as there were serious concerns about uh, the control of music and the control of information, there was also concerns about, well, what is it that we're actually supposed to be doing about this? And should we be doing uh, something about it uh, at all? Around the same time, actually, there were also discussions, similar discussions, about certain content on television, uh, particularly, for instance, surrounding such uh, shows as Roseanne and uh, Married with Children, and then there were sometimes concerns about that, too. What are our children uh, seeing on television? And, of course, the standard response is that it is up to the parents to inform uh, their children and it is up to the parents and the viewer themselves of course to decide whether or not they want to watch a show and whether or not they want to listen to a particular piece of music. The PMRC strictly speaking is an involuntary private organization so they can do whatever they want. They, they um, Well they can do whatever they want within certain limits of the law but they definitely have a right to express an opinion if they feel that certain uh, music is let's say objectionable for whatever reason. On the other hand, uh, artists also have a right to express themselves uh, artistically and other people also have a right to purchase that music and to buy it in the you know, legal marketplace of consumer products, CDs, records, digital downloads and so on, and definitely in the public marketplace of the distribution of ideas. So there's a lot of people that grew up on a lot of uh, music that probably in terms of its contents can be uh, deemed to be objectionable by some people, but which to those people who enjoy that kind of music did not lead to any negative, uh, uh, any negative consequences, so did not impact them in any negative way. So it is, um, let's say, you can say, yes, the PMRC has the right to do this, but you could also say, however, other people also have a right to express whatever their concerns they may have uh, about the PMRC activities. So the fact that there was at least an attempt to link these private concerns to a political response through these Senate hearings, that was something that was very serious, because after all, if there would be any legislation uh, coming from this, that legislation would apply to all citizens of the United States, and not just to those that happen to object uh, to the content of music. The, the, the group was not entirely conservative because actually some of the members of the group were uh, related to the Democratic uh, uh, Party rather than to the Republican Party. So at that in that sense it was a, a bipartisan effort you could say. Uh, nonetheless I would also argue that the you see the, the basic problem is not so much that some people object to certain lyrics. If you don't want your daughter or your son to listen to lyrics that make reference to masturbation, as a parent you surely have the right to you know, somehow deal with that in how you raise your children. Uh, the problem, however, is do you have the right to call in the assistance of the government and of government agencies? And then, of course, there's the entire issue of how are you going to police that? You know, are you going to have cops that are standing ready uh, to arrest somebody for giving a CD to a young person and so on. So then there's an entire criminal justice side to it too. So the, the problem to me is not so much that you have certain ideas as that you would, uh, um, um, that you would force these ideas upon other people. In the United States there is no music censorship because one has to be careful when you talk about censorship. <coughs> In the United States there is no music censorship, but there are, of course, certain, um, let's say, certain artistic pr expressions that more readily are communicated through the mass media and that more readily are available. In the strict sense of the term, however, that is not censorship because, you see, I can find objectionable music and I can do so legally. It's just going to be somewhat more difficult to find it. Um, 
for instance, by implication of the fact that the stickered albums are not carried by all stores, particularly, I believe, uh, Walmart and other of those uh, bigger outlet chains, they don't carry uh, stickered albums and stickered CDs. So, in that sense, it is more difficult to find that kind of music, but in a strict sense, there is no uh, censorship. Uh, one of the obvious factors in all of this is, of course, age, because popular music, pop music, rock music, rap, hip-hop, and so on, particularly appeals to young people, and the notion is old people can deal with sex, old people can deal with porn, with references to sex, and so on, but young people maybe do not have, uh, let's say, the intellectual or emotional capacity to do that. And again, you know, an argument can be made for that, although an argument, of, of course, can also be made that withholding information about sex can also be very damaging to young people as they after all one day will mature uh, to adulthood. Uh, so age I think is a very important factor because that's the kind of music uh, that, uh, you, you know, it's the kind of music that is targeted, is the kind of music that young people listen to. You know there's a lot of objectionable references to sex and violence in classical music too, but obviously that's not what they're talking about. Race is very good to bring up because there was actually a transformation at the time of the PMRC from rock music, pop music, to rap music, hip-hop music. Uh, let's say that transformation took place from the mid-80s until the early 90s, so fairly quickly. So there was a transformation somewhat from objectionable pop and rock to objectionable hip-hop, and obviously there is a racial component involved there that, you know, it's after all uh, an African-American art form is, is hip-hop. Uh, the 80s, the early 90s, there was so much to do about um, sexuality and about maybe other objectionable issues in pop and rock music, all of that has pretty much subsided. And we've kind of learned to live with the situation where we are now, which is basically the sticker. The notion, you know, some music has the sticker, some music does not. And it is somewhat surprising to me, although not altogether, but from an artistic viewpoint, it is surprising how easy pop, rock, and rap uh, artists are living with this because what they do is they make two records. They make one that is explicit, one that is not. So there is an accommodation of this, uh, this form of control. From an artistic point of view that is very, very questionable because an artist is supposed to be free. An artist is supposed to express what he or she wants and not to take into account, not even to take into account the taste of the audience, let alone an issue of control. The issue there, of course, is that art does not exist in a vacuum, but exists in a society. And in that society, in our society, money is always a big concern. You have to, you know, you have to survive somehow, and you probably want to survive better by selling more. And there is clearly a sort of capitulation, if you will, of the pop, rock, and rap artists towards the market uh, forces that are at work. And in that respect, a lot of these censorship issues have now subsided. Why? Because of the entire technological revolutions that have taken place uh, since the Internet and since uh, particularly the existence of uh, file hosting uh, sites and the ease with which uh, music can be obtained, uh, you know, without having to pay for it. And that economic issue is now much more in the, at the forefront than are any concerns about the content of lyrics in pop and rock music.